Welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film The Oil Machine have become even more urgent in recent months with dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living and our climate. A year on from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, we're going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Kevin Anderson. Kevin is Professor of Energy and Climate Change in the School of Engineering at the University of Manchester and the University of Uppsala in Sweden. Thank you for joining us today, Kevin. We've seen some incredible images in the news in the past few months of floods and fires and droughts all over the world. What is the latest science telling us about our climate? Well, I want to be really clear here. We have, to be, we have to be very careful in saying that any particular event is caused by climate change. But having said that, we are definitely now seeing an increase in severity and an increase in frequency of some of these extreme weather events. So whilst they may not always be caused by climate change, they are certainly being exacerbated, made much worse by climate change. And so that, I mean, that's a very clear signal that's coming out. And it's one that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the body that looks at all of this, the scientific body, you know, that's coming out from its own conclusions. So the, the evidence is that we are seeing severe impacts at just 1.1 to 1.2 degrees centigrade of warming. But on the other side of the science, it says about, well, what are we going, what are we going to see? What temperatures are we heading for? Well, at the moment, we're heading much more towards three degrees centigrade of warming. And given some of the what are called feedbacks, some people might call them tipping points, but feedbacks, it may well be that we get to a higher temperature than that. And that is an utter disaster. So whilst we're all signed up, virtually every country in the world is signed up to hold to well below two degrees centigrade, and ideally only 1.5 degrees centigrade as a global average, and that's a huge change from where we are today. In reality, when you look at the policies of all of these countries, including the so-called climate progressive countries like the UK, Sweden, the rest of the EU and so forth, none of us are delivering anything like the, the levels of reductions that is necessary. So the impacts look bad and are set to get much worse. And our emissions are just either the same as they, as they were last year or are going up. So we're not seeing any reduction. So there are no positive global level signs at the moment that we're addressing climate change. The International Energy Agency certainly says we must have no new oil and gas projects so we can meet those commitments. Yet with the turmoil of the war in Ukraine the last few months, the UK government's now pushing out over 100 new North Sea oil and gas licenses. So is the government right to focus on national energy security in this way? Well, no, it's completely misguided, but I don't think it's doing it because of the war in Ukraine. The, the UK government has completely misunderstood, perhaps I think deliberately so, the scale of the climate challenge. In, you know, it's, it's at best climate contrarian, the government, if not climate sort of denial stroke sceptic. So it has not seriously addressed the climate issue and, and it has no intention of doing it regardless of Ukraine. Um, it has, it has failed, and in, as indeed have most industrialized countries, to make the shift away from fossil fuels over the last 20 or so years. The reason that we are facing the challenges we face today on energy are not solely down to Putin's illegal um, invasion into, into Ukraine. They are as much down to the fact is that we have not bothered to move away from fossil fuels. If we had done what was required by the science to meet the targets that were set by our policymakers, we would not be in this position today. We would have retrofitted our homes so we wouldn't have to use as much energy to heat them. We would have got a much better public transport system um, and we would have had a lot more renewable energy, indigenous renewable energy. So we are in this position because of the failure of our leadership for the last 20 or so years, not solely because of Putin's invasion into Ukraine. Yes, I mean, for, for just over a month, we had a Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Jacob Rees-Mogg, who said he wanted to, quote, get every cubic inch of gas out of the North Sea. And now we have a new Energy Secretary, Grant Sharps, under a new Prime Minister. What do you think will happen now? Will this change? Uh, the, the rhetoric will change a little bit, but not the overall framing. Um, our leadership that we have at the moment, and in fact, our senior policymakers, 
are just ill-equipped and unable to address the climate challenge. So only if they are forced to by, by wider public uh, pressure or, or the, or I think actually the academic arguments no longer make a difference for these people, but they need to be pushed probably by the voters and by wider civil society, will they change their mind? Um, so no, I don't think the, the, the new government will really make any significant difference. Um, the, the previous incumbent at Bayes was terrible. I mean, he knows nothing at all about the energy realm. I think the, the current one is probably slightly better, but overall, relative to the scale of the climate challenge, they simply do not, either are not prepared to accept what the science is telling us. It seems that's also the case with corporations. One argument put forward by the industry is that North Sea oil is a positive step towards net zero, as it'll have a lower carbon footprint than imported fuel. And um, what can we do to track tackle such greenwashing? Uh, greenwashing is, is a polite term. It's lying. Um, mm. The government's own advisor, David, the late, very sadly, the, the late David Mackay, he was the, the scientific advisor to the Department for Energy and Climate Change. When he did his report on shale gas, he very specifically made the point that any new fossil fuel resources brought to market would play against our efforts to reduce cumulative emissions associated with climate change. The government's own advisor made that very clearly. He was an absolute expert in his area. So when we hear these other ministers who generally hold the portfolio for a matter of days or minutes, and you know, express these absolute categorical statements that we're going to reduce, um, we're going to help the overall global challenge on climate change by having more oil and gas. I mean, it's, it's just nonsense. And the journalists need to take these people to account. I'm sure that India and China make the arguments that more coal is what we need to help us reach, reach our commitments. You know, more coal, more oil, more gas, that will help us get down to zero emissions. How can more fossil fuels reduce fossil fuel emissions? So countries have made these commitments, such as the Paris Agreement, and we're on the eve of COP27. Our new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says he's now not going to the COP. Are COP conferences a waste of time? It, it's tempting to say yes. I think they have a role, but I think there's too much emphasis on the COP processes or the COP, the big COP events. Um, yes, I think world leaders need to meet at them. Um, and I personally think that it should all be recorded so everyone else can see their discussions as well. I'm not enthusiastic about the huge climate jamboree that goes around it, which is little more than a tourist um, fair, as far, a tourism fair, as far as I can see. Um, so I think that the leaders need to meet with their scientific advisors, with fewer economists and almost no lawyers, and probably some of the people being impacted by climate change also being in the room as well. That is important. Um, but I think the, 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 you know, the huge scale of the COP events now has got out of, uh, uh, it's got out of hand, really. Are you going to the COP27? Uh, no, I'm not. Um, I have been to a few COPs, not very many. I tend to go to the ones that I can easily get to by, by public transport. Um, and if I can't do that, then I, I don't attend. But the great thing now, of course, is we can all engage virtually anyway. So, that for, so for many of us, we simply do not need to be there. But a lot of people like going and let's be honest about this this includes a lot of the ngos civil society groups a lot of the academics we like these sorts of events so it's not just that we want to go there and try and make a difference we enjoy you know the, the meeting other friends from all around the world and so forth and i think that is part of the problem that we haven't demonstrated that we can do our, our, our pursue our activities differently so why necessarily should the policymakers and others if we can't demonstrate how to how to live our lives both from our work and our personal perspective um, in, a, in a lower carbon fashion. It does seem that there's a challenge in communicating the truth of what's going on to the general public up against governments and corporations. And I know you're collaborating on a brilliant new resource called Climate Uncensored with a blog, a YouTube channel, a podcast and more. Why is this uncensored? In our view, we have deliberately sweetened the pill on climate change, on what we have to do about climate change, not about the science. So let's be really clear about this. And the scientists have done a fantastic job, often against um, incredible opposition, um, again, broadly lying by the fossil fuel companies for decades. And the scientists have actually won out, the science has won out. You know, 
other than a few enclaves, basically everyone now accepts the science that underpins climate change. What we have not been prepared to accept, and in that I mean the expert community as well. So those are you know, the academic community, the NGO community, the broader expert community on climate change. We have not been prepared to accept what that science tells us about what we need to do if we're to deliver on our commitments that we've made at, in, in Paris or indeed at all of these big international negotiations. And there we have sweetened the pill. And we've done that for a whole set of reasons, but not least because we are simply unprepared to question the current sort of dominant socioeconomic paradigm, the way that we see the world, the way the world is in many respects, we're not prepared to question that. And so we try every little fudge that we possibly can to reconcile the irreconcilable. Um, and actually in, in private, I don't really get much disagreement from many of my scientific and other academic and expert colleagues in the, on this. Indeed, even when I talk to policymakers, in, in, the, in, you know, in front of a microphone or in front of a camera or with a microphone, you'll get a, a sweetened version of, of what the actual, well, not even a sweetened version, it's, it's, it's far more than that. It's a completely untruthful version of the challenge that we actually face. And so it, we felt, we, we set up this site to try to, just to say, clearly without, without either exaggerating how bad things are or being naively optimistic about what technology can do in isolation from social change. We felt that was an important sort of a gap there, if you like, in providing information for people who want to engage in these issues. And that's what we're trying to do with Climate Uncensored. Uh, I've seen on the site that you talk about a mitigation denial. What does that mean? Yes. Um, in fact, the, the, there's uh, a, a new book out, The Climate Book by Greta Thunberg, and the, the, the section that I wrote in that focuses on this whole sort of concept of mitigation denial. And this is that we, we're all aware, aware of, of the, uh, what we call climate denial. I mean, basically, people who just, just don't like the repercussions of what the science says. And that has been driven, as I say, by the oil companies deliberately. They were fully aware of the um, impacts and dangers of climate change a long, long time ago, but they literally have lied year on year, decade on decade about these issues and continue to do so today. And it's easy to blame them. But actually, I think the expert community who have obviously accepted the science has not accepted that we have to do what we have to do about mitigation. We have denied the scale of the mitigation that is required, the scale of the cuts and emissions that are required. Because if you're honest about the scale of the cuts and emissions that are required, you have to fundamentally reshape many aspects of modern society. In particular, you've got to really focus on where most of the emissions come from. And most of the emissions relate to the lifestyles of a relatively few people in the world. And who are that group? Well, in that group are the professors, the journalists, the climate experts, the policymakers, the entrepreneurs, the business leaders, all the people who have shaped the climate agenda um, and have shaped the models about what we need to do about climate change. All of that group are in the very high emitting sector, with a few exceptions, no doubt, but virtually all of us in that group. And we are simply unprepared to accept the implications for how we have normalized our lives that comes out of our own science. And I think we have to start, we have to stop and stand back and reflect a little bit on why is it that we have continually pushed for more and more exotic technologies in our what we call our scenarios and our in our advice to government about what we need to do rather than actually focus on quite fundamental changes we need to make in how we run society today. Um, and I think that has been driven very much by those of us who frame this debate being high emitters ourselves. I'm definitely looking forward to diving into the climate book, Greta Thunberg's new book about how our world's changing and what we can do about it. And I know you're one of the contributors. What will I find in the book? You'll find a huge array of um, of research that's put in a, in a language that's broadly accessible to, to most people because obviously most people don't engage in the in the sort of ridiculous jargon that we use as academics and experts so it's, most of it is, is there's been attempts to write it in a way that's accessible to everyone um, and you'll find some stories in there which don't all fit neatly together that's because we do have some different views but broadly all of the storylines within there are pointing in the direction of we need to make some significant rapid changes in what we're doing today, whether we're looking at the impacts of climate change, how we can adapt to those impacts and what we can do to make sure those impacts don't get any worse or not much more worse anyway. And so there's a there's a wealth of, of, um, of inputs to the book. So I'm, I'm hoping it will, it will. It will help civil society get a better handle 
on what the challenges are and therefore be able to push the policy agenda and indeed the scientific community to be more direct, more honest, and actually most importantly, of course, is to drive for action on reducing our emissions. I think the real change in the tone of the debate around climate change has not been driven by the scientists and by the experts. It's not been driven by the policymakers and the great and the good, by the royals or by the celebrities. It's been driven by this, sort of, um, this sort of almost like gaggle of civil society in its various sort of messy ways coming together and, and actually driving the agenda. And I think actually it's almost strange that there's been more scientific rigor in the, in, at least in the requests of civil society for change than we're actually seeing out of the scientific community and indeed out of the policy community. So I think this, the civil society has been, is at the moment absolutely key in driving an agenda of integrity and indeed of courage. And I hope that this book will feed into the wider civil society, not just the ones that are engaged now, but more people to get, to get engaged, to put pressure on our policymakers, to actually put things in place, to bring our emissions down and to adapt to the climate change that we've already caused. And I would say, particularly for the high emitting countries of the world, to actually sit, take our responsibility to poorer parts of the world much more seriously than we have done so far. What should we be demanding of our leaders right now? I think we have to turn that around slightly, say what, we should, what should we demand of ourselves first and how does that play out in what we demand for our leaders? So my simple answer is a sort of a three-pronged answer here is that we need to look at our own lives and try to reduce our own emissions from the, particularly from the areas where most of our emissions come from. But I'm not really interested in the actual you know, the emissions themselves, because for any one person, with a few exceptions, they're not that great in the global picture. The point about that is that when we make those changes, we can then, we have something we can use to discuss with our friends, with our colleagues, about what we're doing. We can start a dialogue about change, about what we can do. And so we may not be successful, but talk about things honestly. But that, that allows us then to talk within our places of work, our places of study, our local institutions, our local businesses. It allows us to talk with our local policymakers. Can we start a whole dialogue at that level? But it also requires us, I think, to talk with our national policymakers. So where we have a mechanism for doing that, either via social media or established, um, established media, via emails and letters, um, we can engage with our policymakers. And so we need to also be pushing them really hard to abide by the commitments they have made. So they have committed to reduce emissions in line with 1.5 degrees centigrade of warming, particularly that came out in Glasgow. Let's hold them to account for that. And so it's that, it's that sort of three, three pronged element. Make the changes yourself, but most importantly, talk, that, talk about that with our friends, family, workplaces and colleagues and so forth, but also engage with the political realm. Those three together, I think, are what we need to do as citizens to drive a real change. Change will not come top down. Do not rely on the leaders to deliver what is necessary. They have failed for 30 years. They'll fail for another 30 years if they're given a chance. The only way that, it will, that they will start to deliver on their commitments is if the rest of us in society push them hard to do so. So what do you think is the greatest opportunity for us in this moment? Honesty, which is easy to say, but not easy to deliver. Um, we have, as I say, we have sweetened the pill for far too long. Um, we need to just be completely honest, not to overplay the doom and not to, under, not, not to um, overplay the sort of naive optimism, if you like. So I think we need just, just brutal honesty and compassion. And those two will help us understand and deliver the, the requisite technical changes and the social changes. But until we are honest with ourselves and with others, we'll just carry on this process of delusion that we've, that we've pursued for 20 or 30 years. Well, thank you, Kevin Anderson, for joining us today. The Oil Machine is now showing in cinemas across the UK, and you can also contact us about hosting a community screening for your organisation, your business or your group, wherever you are. Find out more at theoilmachine.org.